I was, uh, I don't know where it came from initially. I think I was, like, like most kids, when I was six or seven, I was into everything and I had phases where I was interested in things and then I'd get bored with it and go on to something else. And I just got interested in radio. Um, I grew up in Wales. I hadn't travelled the world. I didn't have parents who travelled the world. And I had a shortwave radio. And I, by twiddling in my shortwave radio, I could hear Radio Moscow and Radio Netherlands and all of these foreign radio stations. And it just seemed amazingly exciting that there was this big world out there that I could access through, through my shortwave radio. And I just became this shortwave radio anorak where I would just spend my evenings listening to these shortwave broadcasts and trying to work out where they came from or if they were in a, in a, if they were in a foreign language and it just seemed like there was this, this massive world out there that I could access through my radio um, and so I hooked, I got my mind hooked on this and rather than it becoming one of these fads that wore off I just stuck with it and I decided from the age of about seven or eight that I wanted to work in radio and uh, it never went away Has that one got audio meters on it? Has the screen got audio meters on it, or does it just go in? You have to hope for the best. Yeah. Um, there probably is a way of doing that, but I, I'm so it's fine. kind of new. Yeah. So I'm going to stick that one kind of there. Yeah. Do you want me to prop it up a little bit just so it. Yeah, shall we? Oh, just prop it up on the box. So good having a BBC <laughs> 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 There we are. That should be all right. One, two, three, four. Yep. Yeah. Uh, where do you want me looking? Right, uh, left, down the barrel. Yeah. Sounds like a good day. <laughs> Hello. 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 You guys from TVU? We're from the Met Film School. So okay. We're, um, we're learning to make documentary films. Right. So we're meant to be practicing our interview skills today. I'm a, I'm a journalist as well. I work for the Hi. BBC, so you've got better cameras than I have. Better kit than I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous. How do you feel we're doing? Are you doing pretty well. Uh, yeah, you've got all the gear. Do you like your job? I do. Uh, I spend about half the time over here in Britain and half the time travelling. So doing similar stuff to you. Making documentaries and news films. So... Uh, I know what it's like standing What's around in the cold for hours on end. What's your kind of subject or is it all sorts of things? Well, I work in foreign news, so it can be anything from uh, Charlie Hebdo to Ukraine to Syria and everything else. Do you get into situations? I have done, yeah. Yeah, I've got a few, a few got war a story. stories. You've got a little story for it. Do you want me to do my war story? Yeah, I was uh, I was working for BBC News in 2003, and um, we knew that the Iraq War was going to happen, or we were pretty sure that there was going to be a war in Iraq, and um, we didn't know when it was going to start. But uh, I was part of a, a big team of people that were sent to northern Iraq um, in February 2003 to prepare for the war. Uh, as I say, we didn't know when it was going to happen or where it was going to happen. But we just uh, took an opportunity because the Turkish border was usually closed. It was quite difficult to get into northern Iraq through Turkey. Uh, and they, they briefly opened the border. So um, we went in there in, in February 2003 to, uh, to wait, for, wait for the war, basically. Tuesday, March 11th, 2003. Things are getting serious in the poker lounge. The buttons, each worth half an Iraqi dinar, are changing hands at a dizzying pace. Chief beneficiary is Serb warlord Dragan Petrovic, whose prowess at the card table is unsurpassed. Afghan snapper and Baldrick looky-likey Abdullah is still in the hunt. 
but the chips are slipping like water through the fingers of Californian cameraman Fred Scott. Overseeing the proceedings is John, the hustler Simpson, who plays his cards very close to his ample chest and whose poker face gives little away. Meanwhile, we're stepping up our war planning. Events at the UN have made the schedule extremely difficult to predict. Will the US lose patience with the Security Council and go it alone? Will our operation in Baghdad be shut down, making a dash for Baghdad our main priority? What will happen in the key strategic cities of Mosul and Kirk? We just don't know, and yet we have to prepare for every possibility. It's impossible to predict whether military action will happen this week, this month, or this year, but we're drawing up plans A, B, C and D, factoring various possibilities in terms of personnel, equipment and story. There's a real sense among the team that things are about to get very busy. Any journalist, probably on their first day of journalism school, learns the who, why, what, where, when uh, way of telling a story, that there are certain facts that any journalist covering a story will uh, want to get in there, the, the key facts. But beyond that, again, it's, it's about art or craft rather than science. Uh, if you asked six journalists to cover exactly the same event, each one of them would cover it in a different way. Why? Well, it comes down to their individual interests, it comes down to their individual expertise, uh, and it comes down to the way that they like to tell stories. Um, I think people who don't work in the media think that there is this objective truth out there that uh, uh, that can be grasped at, but a lot of it is about interpretation of, of a particular event, interpretation of a particular story, and every journalist will do that differently. Thursday, March 27th, 2003. Thursday was a momentous day for us. After almost two months in the region, the Northern Front, albeit a scaled-down version of what was originally intended, is finally open for business. For the moment, at least, we're the centre of the story. We were woken by the news desk at 7.30, and for the next eight hours we barely drew breath. The rolling news monster had us in its grip, and it wasn't going to let us go. Each hour was filled with lives for World TV, News 24, World Service, Radio 4, 5 Live, you name it, interspersed with the odd rushed phone call to find out what was actually happening. By about four o'clock I was suffering from non-stop news narcosis and needed to go out for an hour. Our translator, Rabin, took us to the bazaar to buy some army surplus souvenirs, heartless war tourists that we are. I came away with a rather natty Iraqi army beret, perfect for those dress-as-your-favourite despot theme parties. Cameraman Carve bought a balaclava, which makes him look like an ETA terrorist. Jim was not impressed. The mood at the bazaar was... bizarre. Since dawn, the TV had been filled with images of paratroops jumping out of planes onto the Bashir airfield. They could have easily landed on the runway, but that wouldn't look as good on the TV, would it? But in the market, it was though the war was in another, distant country. Traders were shouting their wares, fruit and veg was piled high on stalls, and chickens condemned to death pondered their fate. The only evidence of the war was the TVs tuned to Al Jazeera in the tea shops and kebab joints, but most people didn't seem to be paying much attention to the screens. It seemed that the people were going about their business, seemingly oblivious to the conflict on their doorstep, but they actually think that's rather healthy. While war rages in their midst, many ordinary Kurds are going about their daily lives, buying fruit and veg, baking bread and drinking tea. Um, where we were in the north was the sort of front line between the areas controlled by the sort of semi-autonomous Kurdish areas and, and the areas controlled by Saddam Hussein. So we went as far south as we could and we were sort of watching the, as the troops moved and, and sure enough as the war um, got underway Saddam Hussein's forces were, were moving backwards, they were retreating south. Um, and so I went to film a, uh, a trench up until the day or so before that trench had been the, um, the sort of front line position between the Kurdish forces and, and, uh, and Saddam Hussein's forces and, and overnight they'd, they'd abandoned it. So we went there, um, a sort of normal day's filming, we just went to have a look at what was going on. So we arrived in, in this town called Kifri and uh, went to see the local commander and said what's happening here and, and what's the situation and he sort of took us up onto his roof and showed us this, this ridge on the edge of the town. And he said, well, the, the, the troops were there up until last night and, and they'd just gone. We don't know how far back they'd gone. And he gave us a, one, of his, one of his soldiers to escort us up to this ridge. Um, so we drove there. 
uh, park the vehicle and um, the plan was to, to get out of the vehicle and film this, this position and then say, you know, up until yesterday this was the front line. Wednesday, April 2nd, 2003. As the conflict enters its second week, it's beginning to take its toll on the personal lives of some of the journalists based here in Sylmania. Over dinner, two members of the press pack tell me they've split up with their girlfriends over the phone or email in recent days. With no end to the assignment in sight and no return date, some loved ones have had enough. It's dawning on some of us that even if we wanted to go home, we couldn't. The border with Turkey, Iran and Syria are sealed, making movement in and out difficult if not impossible. One colleague chose the most drastic option, being medevaced out, although he didn't tell his managers. The death of the Australian cameraman Paul Morgan hit him hard and he wanted out. Other colleagues are pondering possible escape routes, either because they've had enough or because the northern front is shaping up to be a mere shadow of what we originally expected. Uh, I got out of the vehicle, um, immediately heard this explosion, heard a blast, and in the sort of seconds that followed, I assumed that, or we all assumed independently, that, that we were being shelled. We thought what had happened is that the, the, the troops that had retreated had seen us from a distance and were, were shelling us from their position. Obviously, if they'd abandoned that position, we knew that they would know where it was geographically, so they could probably target it quite um, accurately. Um, so there was, a, there was a, a, a huge explosion and I looked down and I could see that my um, foot had been blown wide open, the back of my foot had been blown wide open, um, so my, my, the back of my foot was basically hanging off. Uh, and it was our translator who um, realised it wasn't mortars, it was a mine and he shouted mines, mines, mines. Um, and the training that we get uh, you're sort of alerted to or, or educated about the dangers of landmines and, and the thing about them is you don't know exactly where they're positioned and how many there are in an area so it's like you pass the parcel and then you know when the music stops you're afraid if you look left there might be a mine if you look right there might be a mine you just don't know where they are sort of in the confusion that followed uh, everybody just scattered there was uh, Jim Muir um, the correspondent I was working with Carver Golestan our cameraman uh, a soldier and uh, and a fixer, and everybody just scattered, uh, not realizing in the initial seconds it was a mine. Um, and in just in those few seconds, Carve, our cameraman, tried to to run away from the vehicle, thinking the vehicle was under attack. And I heard, as I was lying uh, lying on the ground, uh, I heard two more explosions, one after the other, um, and it subsequently turned out that Carve had stepped on one mine and then fallen onto a second. Um, then you find yourself in one of those situations, well, what do you do? You're in the middle of a minefield. It's sort of, you know, that is a bad day at the office. Um, I knew that if I tried to roll for cover that I could trigger another one. I knew that obviously I couldn't run because my foot was, was blown open. So it's, what do you do? Um, because I just stepped out of the Jeep, I, I was able to drag myself, I, I, was, I was right next to the, the Jeep and the door was open, I was able to sort of drag myself and grab the, uh, the top of the Jeep and pull myself back in again, um, trying not to disturb any, any ground. Um, I, was, I, I did that and, and got into the back of the Jeep and, and then carried on doing my sort of first aid on myself. So Jim did something that they wouldn't recommend you do on the uh, on the hostile environments course, which is our, the back of our jeep was full of full of camera cases and, and and flight cases. So he started pulling the flight cases out of the back of the vehicle and throwing them forward. The idea being that if he threw them forward, it could trigger any any mines that were in the area. It probably wouldn't have been one hundred percent effective, and I think it's just just luck or uh, good luck that that. Uh, he didn't, he didn't set anything off or there were no other mines in the area. Um, he saw Carve on the ground, he was, he was already dead. Uh, so Jim dragged his body uh, back out 
from where from where he'd fallen um, and pulled it back to the jeep when I uh, by the time Carvey's body got back into the jeep it, I thought he was just unconscious because um, Jim had wrapped the bottom or covered the bottom of his body with a, a, a blanket um, partly so that I didn't panic but uh, apparently had pretty severe sort of lower body injuries so uh, when I saw him he just looked like he was he was unconscious I didn't realize quite how uh, injured he was um, so he laid his body on the back of the on the jeep um, I was I was in the back in the sort of in the boot compartment um, and uh, and Jim then reversed the the vehicle out of the minefield because of course you know if you turn the vehicle around then you could trigger more but because it was springtime you could see the grass had been pushed down by the by the tracks of the wheels so he was able to sort of reverse back out the way that he'd come and get onto uh, onto uh, more more safe ground and then and then drive out and, and get us get, get me to, to hospital Um, impish is the best way I can describe him. Uh, I didn't know when I first met him um, quite what an uh, accomplished filmmaker he was. Um, I was relatively new to, to foreign news and um, Carve had been working for the, uh, for the BBC for many years in Tehran before our bureau was, was closed down and uh, he, was, he was quite short, he was probably about five foot five. Um, with a, a great big mop of, of grey hair and a big bushy grey beard um, that he would always be chuckling under and you could just see him at the sort of top of his mouth chuckling under his beard and, he, and, I, and, I, and I, I'll always remember he smoked these strange little cigarettes they weren't like normal sized cigarettes they were these tiny ones they were like miniature cigarettes and he'd always be puffing away at those uh, and him and Jim had worked together for, for many years so they had a very good relationship and it was I guess it was a bit like watching a husband and wife sometimes that the, the two of them would uh, would be arguing with each other and uh, Jim was like the uh, I don't know he, he I wouldn't say he was like the boss but he always thought he he knew what was right and Carvey would just shrug his shoulders and and, and grin at me sometimes and just say that no, it's Jim being Jim but he was a good person to be around um, very uh, very good fun um, very knowledgeable and it was only after he died actually I realised quite mm -hmm. what, he'd, what he'd achieved in his life uh, so then I was driven uh, I don't know how many hours it was it seemed like forever but I was driven in, a, in an ambulance to um, the nearest big town where there was a, a full size hospital uh, while all of this was going on while we were dealing with the immediate emergency my colleagues in London were uh, alerted to what was going on and um, they started um, setting the wheels in motion to, to get me help and uh, they put the word out to uh, our colleagues from ABC, the American network, that, that one of their guys was in trouble um, and ABC had contacts with the American military on the ground. Um, so while I was being driven to the sort of local hospital that was all being set in motion and I'll, I'll <laughs> I'll never forget, I arrived at this hospital um, and by the time I got there the other journalists had heard what was going on so some of my colleagues were already there and, and um, waiting for me when I arrived and if, as if the situation wasn't surreal enough then you know, I'd been there a little while and then uh, th this uh, detachment of American special forces appeared in the room fully tooled up with all of the, uh, you know, the night sights and the helmets and the guns and uh, sort of said you know we're here to we're here to help you um, and they took me to their hospital they had a, American Special Forces had set up their own field hospital fully equipped field hospital um, nearby um, once I was stable a couple of days after uh, the blast I was stable enough to be to be transported and I was flown to Cyprus to the the Americans handed me over to the British so I was flown to the British uh, RAF base in Cyprus um, 
And I remember I had a, my mobile phone with me and I remember being off my head on morphine and phoning everybody I knew one after the other in the middle of the night. It just seemed like a really good idea. If, if you have enough morphine, it seems like a really good idea to just let's phone everybody and see. Let's have a chat. So then I was lying in a hospital bed with my leg <laughs> in pieces, ringing everybody up for a chat. Um, and uh, I, I remember there, I don't know how long, how long I've been there, maybe a day or two. It's difficult to, to know. Um, but I was asked to stand up. I, the, the, the doctor said to me, he came out looking at me and he said, can you, can you stand up? And they gave me a, a frame and got me to stand up. And I remember I was standing up and obviously my heel had, was gone. It, it was all in bandages, so I didn't, I didn't know the extent of the injury. Um, but my heel was, was completely gone. And as soon as I stood up, all the weight of my body went down and it was, it was agonizingly painful. I couldn't stand. I remember the doctor sort of looking concerned and I thought, right, okay, well, I got to get in my head the idea that, that my leg's going to go. Sunday, April 6, 2003, 8.15, just woken and had breakfast and the first moment of bleakness since the accident has descended. Until now the thought of getting home, seeing friends and family, hugging my girlfriend was enough to tide me over. Now the real prospect of what lies ahead is beginning to dawn. It still doesn't feel like all this has happened to me. It's as though I'm in a dream that I'll soon wake up from. Deep down, though, I know that's not the case. The value of the support I've received from families and colleagues has been immeasurable. i felt buoyed on a cushion of good wishes. Reading the cards, emails and messages has given me great strength. Ultimately, though, I know there'll be dark days ahead. At the moment, it looks as though I'll lose the foot and part of my leg. It could be worse, but it's not great. I'm stealing myself for what's to come and hoping I have the inner strength to deal with it. Then there's the issue of learning to walk again, drive a car, stupid bureaucratic things like compensation. Just writing this helps. Carve's funeral is taking place today in Tehran. He's foremost in my mind. He'll be missed terribly. There could quite easily have been two funerals taking place and I thank whoever's looking after me up there that I made it through. I was lucky, very lucky. How does your wife feel? Is she um, my wife, my now wife was my girlfriend at the time and uh, I came back, uh, you know, obviously in a, in a pretty bad way and didn't know what the future was going to be. Um, I didn't know whether I was going to be able to walk again. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to go back to work. So it was a sort of very unsettling time. And uh, I said to her very early on, if this is too much for you to handle, you've got to tell me. But she's, uh, she's got very broad shoulders. And she took it all on, you know, very well, and and never wavered. So she's been, she was, she was fantastic. Um, what was I feeling? I mean, I was, I, I think I felt relieved that I was alive. Um, I think my family probably kept bits of information. I knew that Carve, I, I knew that Carve was dead. Um, I was told that that he died. Um, I remember feeling, um, yeah, I, I, th I guess there was a f feeling of being overwhelmed. Suddenly I'd gone from being 31 year old journalist. I'd wanted all my life to work in foreign news and, uh, had, had, had achieved that. And I wouldn't say it seemed like a big game because I was, I was I've always been you know, very aware of the, the seriousness and the potential dangers, but you always think it's not going to happen to you. And then suddenly you've gone from, I'd gone overnight from being, you know, fit and healthy with my career in front of me to being lying in a hospital bed with my, uh, half of my leg amputated. Um, you know, that's a lot to get your head around. Uh, I think I, I was more overwhelmed by just, there was just seemed to be so much going on around me. There's my family are all, fussing around, worried about me. There's, um, you know, my friends wanting to come to visit. There was some media interest. There's the doctors. And I just remember being in the hospital and just not able to cope with all of this chatter going on around me. And, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd have the news channel on in, in the hospital bed. And then my colleagues who had been working with up until a few days earlier were still obviously on the news. And I was trying to follow what was happening with the war. 
Um, and I, just, I think I was just overwhelmed by just, it was like a hundred people speaking to you at once. I didn't really get time to, you know, get my head around what was going on. Uh, and I, I think there were, there were times in those early stages where I, I just had to shut the door and just be on my own, just to try and, um, just to try and deal with it. But, um, so yeah, I, I, I think it was, it was a bit overwhelming. And I, th I think the other f f big thing I was feeling is I just didn't know what the future held. Uh, I'd never met anybody who had a limb amputated. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know whether I was going to be able to work, and you know, yeah, and it was, well, what happens now? Just no, I had no idea. I was well. I mean, it was it was what over ten years ago now. So uh, I've had plenty of time to get used to it. I was off work for about six months. Um, I was thirty-one, thirty-two at the time. So. Um, I was kind of young and fit, and I suddenly went overnight from being uh, sort of fit and active and running around to being in a wheelchair. And it's when you're in a wheelchair you realise just how difficult just doing normal things are. Getting around, going to the shops, you know, you, things that you don't even notice, like bumpy tracks like this you wouldn't notice when you're walking, but suddenly you realise how much energy it takes. So uh, I was keen to get here as quickly as possible. So I was pretty motivated. So yeah, I was back in work after six months. Um, I mean, I was pretty lucky. I kept my knee, which in terms of the rehabilitation makes it a lot easier and a lot, lot quicker. So uh, yeah, I was, I was kind of, as bad as it was, it could have been a lot worse. Mm. Yeah, I was out of hospital within five days, four or five days of, of the amputation because you know, uh, even though it's a, a, obviously a big operation, it's fairly straightforward, you know, they cut your leg off, sew it up and off you go. Uh, I didn't have any major secondary injuries, I had a few scars and cuts and, and bruises that had to be stitched up, but there was nothing that was, no internal injuries, no other injuries, it was, you know, thankfully a very clean injury, a uh, very straightforward injury. Um, so I was out of hospital within a few days and then pretty much straight into into rehab, um, straight into the, you know, the, the get me walking again, which was very, very slow. Monday, May 5th, 2003. Aileen returns to London and I'm reminded of all the things that are worst about the current situation. The fact that she's living in London and I'm living in Cardiff while I recuperate. The fact that we seem to spend most of our time saying goodbye to one another at train stations at the moment. The fact that my London flat, my home, is out of bounds until I get my artificial leg because it has too many steps and narrow doorways and is unsuitable for wheelchairs and crutches. The fact that I can't just jump into a car and go where I want, when I want. People keep reminding me that I'll be up in no time, that this is only temporary, that I'll be back on my feet before I know it. That may be the case, but right now it doesn't feel that way. I feel stuck, frustrated and going nowhere. Yeah, what happens with is uh, everybody's different, but in the first 18 months to two years, the, the shape of your limb is changing quite quickly. Obviously, it's swollen up to start with when it's first amputated, so that shrinks down. Uh, and then you're asking your body to do things that it's not used to doing, so you're using muscles that you weren't using before, other muscles waste because they're not being used. and uh, so it's changing, it, change, it changes shape quite quickly and as a result um, you, you have to uh, have your leg cast for, for the socket uh, quite regularly, it changes every month or two. Mm. Um, then after 18 months or two years things settle down. Um, but you can have lots of problems along the way, you know, that it's uh, it is, it is like a baby learning to walk again. Um, and you fall over a lot and stumble and then eventually you get used to it and, and, it, and it gets easier. But, but to start with, it's, it's a, it, I, I think for me, it was just an unknown process. I didn't, know, I didn't know what the procedure was. And I talked to other amputees who talked me through it and, and gave me a lot of uh, help and support, but I didn't know what to expect. Wednesday, May 14th, 2003. 
Everyone had warned me it would happen, and today it did. I came crashing down to earth, physically and emotionally. Until now, I'd been getting around pretty well in a wheelchair, and increasingly on crutches. This morning, I was making my way round on crutches, my mind miles away. I think I must have forgotten momentarily that my limb was missing, because the last thing I remember is putting my right foot forward, immediately thinking, oh shit, this is really going to hurt. It did. I came crashing down on the floor, my injured leg taking the full force of the fall. The pain took my breath away. Every nerve ending in my leg screamed and my knee swelled up like a balloon. I must have spent ten or fifteen minutes rolling on the floor in agony. It was, without doubt, the most painful thing I've ever felt. Far worse than the original accident or anything before it. There we are. So that's my souvenir from Iraq in 2003. Wow. So as great a job it is, it can be uh, a little bit hairy at times. Yeah, I'm aware of how the media interprets stories. I wouldn't say how the media bends stories, but, but the media likes a very clear narrative. It likes a beginning and a middle and an end. And in my own experience, I'm aware that I need to uh, boil 45 years of life, uh, 20 years as a journalist, all the things that have happened in my life down to um, a narrative that, that, that people can consume. You know, when you, when you read a biography of someone's life, that, again, it's, it's just a, a snapshot of someone's life. It's one person picking out what they think are the most important parts of somebody's life and focusing on certain parts more than others. So yeah, I'm aware that when I'm telling the story of, of my life and my experience, that, that the public, the audiences need a narrative. They need uh, a way of, of, of understanding things. And sometimes, you know, sometimes that works against us because everybody likes a story with a happy ending. Well, life isn't always like that. Everybody likes a story of triumph over adversity. Life isn't always like that as well. But, but I am aware when I'm telling my story that I have to present it in a way uh, that, 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 that people can, can understand and hopefully relate to. So there is a, a, a large degree of, of editing that goes on. Um, you know, whenever I tell my story, it's factually accurate. But, but yes, I leave out a lot and I, I include certain things. And depending on the audience that I'm speaking to, I may pick up certain things more than others, depending on their interests as well. Um, you know, you can't tell a whole life story or a whole new story, including every single fact, otherwise the piece would never end, it would go on forever. So, so there is editing involved, obviously. I said to the, the medical team, you know, right at the start, how long is it going to be? Um, and they said, you know, six months to a year before you're fully um, rehabilitated. <laughs> <laughs> until you're walking in properly. Uh, I think if it happened to me now, I would take things much more slowly, but at that stage, I just wanted to get on with my life. Um, so I was back at work pretty much full time within six months. Um, I don't know whether that was, in retrospect, the most sensible thing to do. I mean, probably I could have paced myself a little bit more, but that's, that's the way I was then. Um, so I went back to work, yeah, within within six months, and by that time I was, I had a few, you know, minor issues and a lot of hospital appointments. I was, you know, for the first few years, any amputee spends a lot of time in hospital because things are changing quickly before things settle down. Um, but yeah, I was I was back in work and travelling again within six nine months. Monday, June twenty eighth, two thousand and four. At the end of a frantic day in Istanbul, I must make a confession. I was tempted. This afternoon I attended a news conference by President Bush and Tony Blair, arguably the two most powerful people in the world. After passing through the tight security cordon and waiting for a couple of hours in a holding room in the Hilton Hotel Istanbul, I found myself face to face with the two main architects of the war in Iraq. 
the world's media was watching as President Bush and Mr Blair hailed their success in the war against Saddam Hussein. As I sat there, headphones clamped to my ears and listening to the news conference, the temptation to speak was overwhelming. What would happen, I wondered, if I removed my artificial leg, waved it in front of Bush and Blair and proclaimed, See this? This is the outcome of your war. Iraq may have been liberated, but I, and hundreds of others like me, will be burdened with this artificial limb every day for the rest of my life because of the conflict you created. Dozens of cameras were there. An outburst would probably have made the front page news around the world. But what would it have achieved, except for a fleeting 15 minutes of fame? Without doubt, my career as a journalist would be over. The leaders would offer sympathetic words, but little else. Call me a sellout. I bit my tongue and kept silent. Yeah, I um, I think if you talk to a lot of amputees, they'll all go, a lot of them have been through their extreme sports stage and I was no different. I wanted to, I think I wanted to prove to myself that I was no different and I wanted to prove to myself that I could still do things. And I had a sort of very physical manifestation of a disability, you know, I had lost part of myself and I think my way of proving to myself I was still um, capable of achieving things was to sort of start doing running and cycling and all of that stuff. Um, and through that I met a lot of other amputees and I was injured in 2003 and in 2004 I went to the Olympics in Athens and that's the first and, and then the Paralympics and it's the first time I really sort of seen Paralympians and I started seeing these you know, amazing prosthetics um, and amputees, double amputees, above knee amputees, below knee amputees who were achieving amazing things. And um, I guess from a journalist, journalist perspective, you know, I had a story as well. So the idea of putting a journalist with an amputation next to an athlete with an amputation and talking to each other is kind of quite an obvious journalist device. Um, but I, I guess I got quite interested in the technology and, and the idea of what's, you know, can you be better than normal? And there's so much going on around that, that, that I start, started, started looking at that and doing research with prosthetics companies. And, you know, that was good for me because it helped me um, get the best thing that was, that was right for me. Um, but yeah, it, I, I guess, I, I guess it was, it, at that stage it was quite, therapeutic for me as well to see people who were achieving amazing things it sort of gave me hope and confidence that even though um, I've been through this you know terrible incident that I was still capable of achieving things. Monday October 23rd 2006 I'm used to people staring curiously at my artificial leg when I'm out running but a kid who saw me limbering up for the great south run yesterday had a novel explanation for the strange looking piece of carbon fibre attached to my leg. Daddy is that man a robot? she asked. The weather for the GSR couldn't have been worse. Torrential rain from start to finish and stiff sea breezes. I thought my finishing time of 1 hour, 28 minutes and 13 seconds was fairly respectable given the conditions. Wednesday, September 14th, 2005. For reasons I can't explain, the closer I get to my wedding day, the more relaxed I become. A cynic may say it's the feeling of acceptance that comes over a condemned man who's resigned to his fate. I prefer to look on it as proof of my conviction that I'm doing the right thing. More than anything else, Aileen and I want Friday to be as relaxed and informal as possible, and because of this the planning has been fairly painless. The only moment of tension came a couple of days ago, when I was gripped by a wave of panic at the realisation of what we're about to do. The moment soon passed though, and now I'm thoroughly looking forward to the big day. Yeah, uh, Aileen was... Uh my girlfriend when I went to Iraq in 2003. Uh, she is now my long-suffering wife. Uh, she reminded me the other day we're coming up to our 10th wedding anniversary. Which is quite How did you meet? We met in university. Uh, we were studying English in Birmingham and um, we became good mates. And I don't know whether you've ever been in a position where, a situation where you meet somebody and you like them and then you just become friends and you think, oh, that moment has passed. I can't go out with them now because they're my friend now. But we sort of became friends. 
but then we got really drunk one night and uh, <laughs> things shifted gear. Um, uh, we've been together longer than I care to imagine. Um, and she's been fantastic. She's very down to earth. She, nothing flaps, nothing phases her. Even when I lost my leg, she was very practical about it. And um, yeah, she uh, she's dealt with everything amazingly. And and you know when I was having uh, when I had PTSD at, at its worst, it was she dealt with that amazingly. She had, we had a small child. She had to deal with Billy, but she she dealt with it all. And um, she's incredibly strong. I want to talk about um, the stress and how we think about writing or broadcasting about distress and how we can do that well and how we can do that not so well. I know you've got quite a lot of experience in doing this through various conversations I've had. Have you got any insight on that? There are certain news stories where I wouldn't say we go looking for distress. There are certain news stories that are distressing, uh, certain situations that are distressing, um, and we try to reflect that. I think there is a danger that either distress becomes slightly voyeuristic or pornographic, that, that distress becomes so overwhelming that, that actually all you're seeing is, 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 is one small shot, snapshot of somebody in distress. Um, or we regard distress as too distressing, that our audiences don't want to, after a hard day's work, see people in distress. And I think it's, it's, it's a really difficult balance in how, how we deal with that. And particularly mental distress, I think is very difficult for somebody who hasn't been through it to really comprehend what we're talking about. If somebody is in a psychotic state or has been in a psychotic state, how do you explain to somebody who's never experienced that what that kind of distress feels like, what it looks like? It's, it, it's really difficult. Um, I don't have any sort of easy answers about how we do it. I, I, I just think that we need to deal with it sort of sensitively and, and, and with compassion. And it's maybe the sort of thing that does lend itself more to sort of longer form explorations. It's not the sort of thing that, that does work in two minutes and 15 on the evening news. Um, and I think sometimes one of, the, one of the errors that we make is that we see people in the height of distress, whether that be you know, in, a, in a shocking situation, a terrorist outrage or a war, we don't go back to them six months later and say, how are you doing now? What did that distress teach you? Uh, how have you coped with your distress? Have you, have you maybe uh, benefited from some kind of post-traumatic growth from it? And I think that's something that perhaps we should be doing more, is, is to see distress not as something unique or something uh, unusual, but to see it as part of the human experience, to see it as, as, as perfectly normal and as something that people can overcome. Yeah, later on, um, I, did, I think I did probably too well psychologically to begin with. I, um, I went back to work. I did have some PTSD screening quite early on and asked me whether I was sleeping and whether I was depressed and you know all that stuff. And I did feel absolutely fine. And I think I got carried it away by a bit of a wave of uh, the fact that it was a bit of a novelty, you know. There was some attention on me in work that hadn't been there before. Uh, people knew who I was and I sort of got carried away by that slightly and didn't maybe spend as much time really thinking about what had happened as I should have. And so it was sort of three, about three years afterwards I started um, realising that this is going to be it for the rest of my life. You know, the novelty wears off and people forget and it work, people move on and um, you know, time, life moves on as it as it should, but um, things got back to normal, and yet they weren't. Well, they were normal, but they weren't the same. And that's when I think it sort of really hit hit me the sort of enormity of what had happened. Thursday, September twenty first, two thousand and six. 
In just a few weeks, my house will be filled with the sound of a wailing newborn and the smell of baby powder and shit. In anticipation of the new arrival, Dad and I have spent this week turning my spare room into a nursery. I must confess, the sight of the finished room, with its baby blue walls, cot and soft toys, brought a lump to my throat. But I'm sure a few sleepless nights will soon get rid of the rosy glow of anticipation. This weekend, Alien and I are off to our first NCT antenatal class. Suddenly, it has all become very real. It happened very slowly. It didn't, it didn't happen overnight, but I, I started um, struggling a little bit with, um, uh, with what had happened. And it, it, it was triggered by the birth of, of my son, who's eight now. And I think there was a combination of factors that, you know, I've been through this, this life-changing experience, got on with life at normal speed and gone back to work, not spent maybe a huge amount of time really thinking about what had happened and then bang, I become a father and suddenly, you know, that's a massive life change and how much of it was caused by the accident and how much of it would have happened anyway, I'll never know, but um, that's when, you know, that's when the problem started. Mm -hmm. I was doing, uh, I was working as a defence producer so I was covering the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it was pretty full on. Two wars on two different fronts, big news stories, um, demanding job, going back to um, conflict zones, um, and I, and becoming a father as well. And I just found that I, um, I started not coping very well. I, I, and the way it manifests itself as me was, was I started having panic attacks. And I've always had a propensity towards anxiety, but it's always been manageable. But I started having absolutely crippling panic attacks. I would be absolutely drenched from head to foot in sweat. It would be dripping off me, literally. I found, uh, I found it in, impossible to concentrate. I would sit down and try and do something that I would normally do in five minutes and it would take me an hour or two hours. And the more I tried to get a grip on a panic, the more that it would, it would escalate. Um, and then I'd go to bed at night and I would be in a state of complete anxiety. And it felt like my panic thermostat was just turned up. It was just turned up to red and I couldn't get it back under control. And it just got worse and worse and worse. Um, and I got more and more exhausted, more and more afraid. And that was, that was definitely any far, far worse than the physical injury. I mean, I, I dealt with the physical injury pretty, pretty well. And, you know, you have to adapt your life a little bit. But it did, I think the thing was it didn't change who I was. Even when I, when I had a physical injury, it didn't change who I was. And yet when I started suffering from... from Anxiety it changed the person I was, and that's much more difficult, much more scary, I think, than than um, because because I, you know you think how do I how do I get a grip on it, and the more I try to get a grip on it, the more it sort of slipped out of reach. Can you go higher? Great. Okay. slow and I went a long time when I wasn't getting any better um, I was seeing doctors I was seeing psychiatrists I was taking medication and nothing seemed to be cracking it and I I, I think I started losing hope that actually it was going to turn around um, and I thought well you know this is a psychological, a psychological equivalent, but oh, I've broken something. I've broken something inside and it can't be fixed. You know, it's snapped, it's gone, and I'm always going to be like this. And I was terrified by the thought of, am I really going to be this, in this state for the rest of my life? I don't think I can, I can um, spend the rest of my life in this state of complete, near, anxious collapse. Um, and then over time, and it was, it was a couple of years, Slowly, there were a few 
chinks, you know, a few little lights at the end of the tunnel, I would go a day feeling a bit better and then a day feeling worse and then it would be two days and then it would be five days and then, you know, it was, I was still fluctuating a lot backwards and forwards, feeling okay and feeling overwhelmed. But I was starting to see a bit of solid ground in between all of the the mess and I that gave me a little bit of confidence I could see that things were moving in the right direction at last and uh, and I I think the overwhelming, overwhelming feeling was just relief it's like thank god I seem to be starting to get there I'm not going to be like this for the rest of my life um, and that gave me a bit of a foundation to build on um, and things things started improving and the other thing I think that, that, that was massively important was just having meeting other people who'd had similar experiences or had had, had an experience of, of mental health issues it was really helpful just being able to talk to them and seeing what they were going through seeing that I wasn't the only one and actually just spending time with those people and seeing that they would have good days and bad days like I did um, and then some of them would start going back to work and that gave me confidence that well they'd done it and I was in the same state as they are so that that was helpful and just having a very patient and understanding employer and also a very patient and understanding family and friends who just stuck by me and plod, you know plodded along plodded along and I remember when I was I was having um, group counseling and at one stage uh, a lot of it I thought was not particularly useful but I remember one of the counselors said to a group of us and we were all professional people in different uh, lines of work and she said uh, everybody who says when they're here in this hospital that they want to get their life back they want to they, they want to get the life that they had before back uh, everybody always says that but they said if the life you had she says if the life you were living before was so brilliant what are you doing here you know something's gone wrong so you say you want to go back to the person you were maybe actually you should find out what went wrong to to land you in this situation and it seems like a sort of it feels like it seems like a bit of pop psychology but it is I, I when I thought about it I thought actually that's that's a, a fair point that I was so um, absolutely desperate to get my life back I want to be back the person I was before that maybe there were things that weren't right and maybe I, you know maybe I'm only going to get better if I address what what I was doing wrong and do something about it so it, it you know it's a sort of big challenge. It's like, well, I'm gonna to have to change my life now. Uh, it's very scary, but it was helpful because I thought, well, actually, you know, I've now got an opportunity to really look at what I'm doing and what I'm doing wrong and do something about it. And you know, because I do not, I do not want to be in this situation ever again. Thursday, July fifth, two thousand and seven. Free at last. After more than 110 days in captivity, my colleague Alan Johnston is finally free. Yesterday was one of the greatest days I've ever spent at the BBC newsroom. Even the most grizzled hack had a smile on his or her face. Yesterday evening we celebrated Alan's release at the Amnesty International Media Awards, where his parents Graham and Margaret received a standing ovation. And after thinking long and hard about this, I've decided to use Alan's release as an opportunity to draw this blog to a close for the moment at least. The sad fact is that with the demands of my beautiful baby, work and assorted other projects, I just haven't had the time or energy I'd like to devote to this blog recently. I don't like doing things by half measures, so I'd rather stop completely than continue half-heartedly. Although I haven't decided yet, I'm tempted to continue podcasting and would be interested to hear about any projects which might be of interest to a cynical, one-legged hack. It's been a fascinating, stimulating, if at times tragic four years. Thanks to everyone who's followed the journey. You know, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you want to impress the bosses, and you, if somebody says, will you do this assignment, you tend not to say no, even though you can say no. No one forces you to go, especially to dangerous places, but you don't want to, you don't want to say no. Uh, now I, because I'm older and more stubborn, I, I have a more scope to, to pick and choose what I do. Um, not always. One, you know, sometimes things just happen. But uh, 
I guess having a, a degree of seniority now means that I get more say over my travel and more say over my workload and who I work with. And, and you know, I, that's, that's really important to me now. When I, especially when I'm traveling, I, w- I want to be working with people I get on with, that we have a good relationship, that I, we have, you know, a history together. And, and I can do that. And, and, you know, that's really important to me that, that I'm working with people actually that, that, I, that I like especially when you're in, you know, in a bit of a scrape together. You know, actually, it helps if you get on with the person that, mm-hmm. that you're risking your life with. I was going <laughs> to ask you about your family, actually. How do you feel about leaving them, knowing these things? Uh, why don't we ask him? Billy, you know when I go away for work, uh-huh. what do you think about it? Uh, it's depending on how long it is. Yeah, how, when do you start missing me? How long am I away before you... Two weeks is the maximum. Yeah. And what do you think about when when Daddy sometimes goes to dangerous places? What do you think about that? I think it's dangerous. Do you think I should go, or do you think I should stay at home? Stay at home. Do you think I should stay at home? Yeah. And what do you think about Daddy's leg? Well, I'm used to it now. Huh? Um. For now, it's all right. But your friends. I'm, yeah. Your friends think it's cool, don't they? Yeah. They, were, they, they sometimes want to know all about it when I wear shorts in the summer, don't they? Because they, they don't uh, see it as much. No, they don't see it as much, but for you it's just normal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who was setting up a, um, an exhibition about war correspondence at the Imperial War Museum. They were doing a history of war correspondence, and so there were all these famous artefacts, these relics from... Uh, f- uh, famous war correspondence and notebooks and flat jackets and John Simpson's burqa and you know you name it and I was, and he was my colleague was doing some some of the background consultancy on the project and he was telling me about the things that he was collecting he was basically bringing all his friends up and saying that what have you got in your in your cupboard that you can put in the Imperial War Museum and I said well I've got a, I've got a leg I've got a leg in my I'm, and I don't use it anymore I had a phone call from the Imperial War Museum and they said, yes, we'd like to have your leg. I said, no problem, I'll just put it in a box and send it to you. And you can do what you want with it, it's an old one. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. No, you have to go through this whole process of, of if, you do, if you donate something to, the, to a museum, you have to go through this whole process. So they sent me this bundle of paperwork <laughs> saying things like, was this looted from a from a war zone? Is this a uh, a national treasure? And um, what's the, what's the value of it? And what temperatures must it be stored on? And all of these sort of official pa- and this this uh, museum moving company turned up one day, and a guy with you know a white coat and gloves wrapped it in bubble wrap and put it all carefully in a box like it was a Picasso, and, and took it to the museum and. Uh, it was just, a, and I was quite happy to just stick it in a box and send it to them. But it did have a serious point. I mean, I, I laughed about it and, and joked about it, but it did have a serious point, which was to, to educate people about the, the dangers journalists face. But I think what it made me realise is, you know, when you see things in a museum, you think there are these sort of relics, ancient treasures and artefacts, and you kind of, you create these stories and you create these um, narratives about, you know, and you go, you, you enter, I went to this exhibition about war correspondence with, with my leg in it. And um, if you come away, if you didn't do that job and think, hey, war correspondents are really cool. They'd created it, this sort of atmosphere that you go there and it's, we're doing all these heroic things. And, you know, it's a really noble profession. And, um, and I was proud to be part of that, you know, uh, but I just, I also thought well, I'm just a stupid idiot who stepped on a landmine. There's nothing very noble about it. It's just wrong place, wrong time. I think people often think there's uh, some secret art to how news stories get into the bulletin. Um, having worked in news for about 20 years, there isn't. Uh, it is as much um, an art as it is a science. Why a story becomes the lead story on a news bulletin, uh, having worked in news for a long time, I often couldn't tell you. It's down to... Oh. <laughs> 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever think about doing something else? I can't do anything else. <laughs> I do think about doing something else all the time. And if I've had a bad day, yeah, I think about doing something else a lot. Yeah, I don't think that'll ever go away. You know, I still, I still get a buzz out of going on news stories. Now I'm sort of making the news rather than just listening to it, but I still get a buzz out of it. And if I, if I turn up at a big news event and there's lots of satellite trucks and journalists, I still get, a little buzz out of it. It, it, it. it never really goes away. I guess if it, if it went away completely and it's time to give up and find another job. You know, it can be frustrating, it can be annoying, it can be demanding, but it is, when it's going well, it is still, I think, the best job in the world.